A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Denard D'Souza. I'm a research associate at the Maritime History Society. And today I will be moderating the thematic session one. The naval uprising was in some sense the last mm. nail in the imperial coffin. Attlee, the then prime minister of Great Britain confided the cataclysmic role the uprising played in the ousting of the British colonial domination in India. Besides creating geopolitical upheavals, the uprising also gave rise to a new patriotic naval establishment, which would soon transform into the marine wing of the tri forces in post-independent India. Lined up for today are a set of very interesting papers that touch upon the naval uprising and the myriad impacts that it had in shaping opinion, in uprooting the Raj to the events that conspired the creation of the uprising itself. The first paper will be presented by Vishal V. Katkar, student MA part one. He will be presenting his paper on the geopolitical environment beacons from 1945 to 1947 in India. Vishal has completed his bachelor's in history and archaeology from the University of Mumbai and is currently pursuing his master's in history. He has studied oce oceanography, climatology, and various other subjects. He specializes in maritime history, heritage conservation, and management. Over to you, Vishal. You may start. Uh, good morning, uh, respected panjindram and dignitaries for giving me a golden opportunity uh, to begin my presentation on the theme of maritime history. So to, uh, the topic of my today's presentation is the geopolitical environmental beacons in the Indian Ocean ranging from 1945 to 1947. So basically I have uh, chosen this topic for my presentation. Uh, there are two reasons because when we understand uh, any kind of the maritime event or uh, which is always associated with the local geography and the influence of the concurrent political upheavals and paradigm of that particular context. So basically my research is basically attempted to scrutinize the geopolitical upheavals in the Indian Ocean. So Indian Ocean, which basically uh, comprise of the Western coastline and Eastern coastline along with the Northern, Northwestern uh, border and the Northeastern, uh, the strategic significance. And also uh, the Indian, uh, the geopolitical environmental uh, happenings in the Indian Ocean ranging from 1945, uh, the beginning of the post World War II uh, and the leverage of the geographical factors and determinants in the naval uprising of 1946, which strike in the uh, basically Bombay and it has caused the coercive factors and its influence on the, as a dodgy. It acted as a dodgy in the overall Indian uh, and even in the Japanese to the east and even in America in the west. So. This is my topic and basically the crucial role of the Bombay Naval Dockyard, uh, which was uh, kind of witnessing the assaults of the Naval Mutiny in 1946, it has been highlighted. And also I have applied the maritime strategies, the theories of the naval warfare, the theory of object that is a command of the sea. And second, the theory of the means, the, how the constitution of the fleets, the water vessels, such as the, as we know, the uh, HMIS uh, Hindustan, HMIS uh, Talwar, which played very crucial role uh, as uh, in the naval uh, insurrection of 1946. And also the my research also endeavors to establish the intricate relationship between the geographical factors and the geopolitical event, the maritime event of naval uprising and subsequent geopolitical uh, environment of overall Indian Ocean which was uh, the, uh, very significant for 
uprooting the british imperialism and how it acted as a vibrant force for fostering the uh, kind of patriotic feelings among the indians and even in the royal army and uh, uh, royal navy which was very important so basically uh, the aims and objectives of my paper is the first to understand the geopolitical environment of the naval mutiny second to analyze the geopolitical turbulences which was prominent in the asia and also in the east southeast asia and in the west to probe the geographical pathway of the naval mutiny the successive play, uh, kind of the consequential places that had been witnessed by the naval mutiny of 1946 and th fourth important uh, is to assess the relationship between the impeachment of geographical factors on naval uprising and to equate the geopolitical environment from 19 45 so how it became the kind of the breeding ground uh, kind of the breeding ground for the naval uprising of 1946 and how it expanded for the insurrection which was broke out in 1946 ultimately at the bombay on 18 february 1946 and how it expanded and spread as it's kind of ignited the overall uh, the indian peninsula right from karachi in the west to the calcutta in the east this was the uh, kind of the dimension and paradigm which i will be talking about and to juxtapose importantly the application of the theories of naval warfare so i have applied the theories of naval warfare and naval operations on naval insurrection and naval uprising of 1946 so research methodology which i have used for this paper is geographic mapping cartographic analysis from the colonial records then historical archival research method methodology i have applied then empirical analytical research methodology applied application theories of naval warfare to understand the uh, the context and uh, their paradigms which was important for organizing the naval insurrection so which was drastically different from the sepoy mutiny of 19 uh, 1857 the first war of indian in independence how this was drastically different in terms of its manifestation because it was purely as a ma maritime kind of the uh, the political geopolitical event uh, historical event which was different from the sepoy mutiny of 19 1857 and even the subhash chandra bose uh, when he uh, rose the revolt in 1941 so how it became different in terms of its manifestation so basically uh, as we know the my uh, the topic of the presentation how it started how it expanded and how it affected the overall indian ocean so historical discourse for that historical discourse of the bombay's naval dockyard uh, it was very important uh, in the my uh, which i will talking about the period is uh, 1930 to 1947 so as we know the portuguese offered the islands of bombay to the king charles ii of the england as a dowry which exhibited through matrimonial alliances between british and portuguese the honorable british east india company took over the bombay seven islands on 23rd september 1668 and due to that the british infiltrate british started infiltrating in the islands of the bombay uh, as well as through uh, kind of uh, in penetrating the british capitalism in india and bombay then had failed to the industrial deterioration so in 1939 zk as we know there was an anti submarine training school which was established which was located inside the dockyard of the bombay and it had remained there till 1941 as we know that the naval dockyard area is located behind the wall of the main entrance at the lion gate which was listed in grade 1 maritime heritage structure and there were two schools which were established the first it was a shipwright training school and old strokers training school they is they were established in the naval dockyard of bombay prior the beginning of the naval uprising and infrastructural development of the naval dockyard it was inaugurated with the establishment of the mechanical training establishment and this mechanical training establishment made its swift trades from 1936 to 1939 and the work and removal of the installation of the machinery it was also entrusted with the supervision under the supervision of the lieutenant bushan now how uh, the grows uh, had made the plan of the bombay naval dockyard in 1750 
so as the world war second advanced so this was very important to understand why the naval mutiny of 1946 46 it had began uh, with the ignition at the bombay naval dockyard not at the other any coastal sites of india because as the world war second so there was prominent reason uh, as a student of history we always tries to focus on the cause and effect relationship so there was a reason that as the world war second advanced post 1945 the naval dockyard heavily dependent on the support of the naval forces of supreme allied command in the east as we know the india was the british colony and at that time the singapore dockyard fell on 15 february 1942 so the british had no other choice other than to revert back to the bombay naval dockyard to supply the cargo and even the armies and so landing craft base it was again established so because of the british imperial need the landing craft base it was established at the sasson dock in 1943 and with the staff of 15 officers 20 230 ratings and repair facilities then in 1945 to 40 uh, 1944 to 1945 most of the material and logistic support which british had gathered uh, they had to come majorly from the bombay naval dockyard the british east india company also foresaw the need of building ships and the water vessel uh, the shoreline establishment such as the hms salwar which was the breeding ground for the ignition of immediate cause of the naval uprising uh, at the bombay to protect the merchants from the naval attack so have uh, two minutes left you will have to wind up soon okay okay so then the royal uh, indian navy as we know 1946 it had started calcutta madras jamnagar delhi kanpur ahmedabad they had witnessed the influence of naval insurrection then i would like to conclude that uh, basically uh, soon after the cessation of hostilities of the world war second the sailors of hms signal at the bombay they staged the mutiny and then it started from hms salwar warship to ins angre in naval dockyard to barrack castle in the fort heading towards the proletarian districts of the porel and delai uh, delai road on lower porel then it again uh, there were strikes and lockouts and also uh, spread to the karachi hms hindustan and the two battleships important the hms talwar at bombay and hms hindustan at uh, karachi these were the two fleets which used as a means of naval warfare and a bombay harbor and a karachi harbor these were the very important epicenters of the maritime uprising of february 1946 which proves that the naval uprising of 1946 had use the theory of object the by the command of the sea and of the naval mutiny and so with like that i would like to uh, end my presentation thank you thanks a lot vishal uh, that was a nice uh, paper uh, the next we have uh, commander kalesh mohanan he will be presenting his paper on war revolt and end of the british era nature and cause causes of rin revolt of 1946 commander kalesh mohanan is a naval historian he is an instructor in military history and maritime heritage at the indian naval academy he is a visiting faculty and guide for mphil phd students in military history at the naval war college goa and is a recipient of junior research fellowship from indian council of historical research ministry of hrt he has a phd and a post doctoral research in naval history from center for historical studies jawaharlal nehru university he has published more than 30 articles in national and international journals he has authored the book maritime heritage of india and the royal indian navy trajectories transformation and the transfer of power welcome commander mohanan you may uh, present your paper thank you dinner <clears throat> good morning uh, flag officers officers and ladies and gentlemen first of all uh, thank you amateurs for giving me an opportunity to speak on the royal indian navy operation 
today's my uh, topic is uh, war revolt end of the british era uh, i'll be speaking about the nature and culture of the royal indian navy revolt of 1846 uh, before begin with my presentation i would like to share something now uh, especially that's the uh, when you're looking for beauty of literature the material if you know whenever anybody wants to take any study on any particular subject always the researcher always look for the primary source in this case the royal royal indian navy episode of 1946 the sources are very limited first of all the rian enquiry commission that is available in in india that is at the national archives of india apart from that all correct official correspondence between the royal indian navy and the british admiralty these materials are available then london and its the naval historical branch of the navy and secondly if in 2021 someone wants to conduct any survey or research most of these participants they are no more and hardly any books literature written on this particular subject mainly like professor deshpande is a professor uh, in delhi university his books he talks about the arian mutiny and his forces the reasons and bc that he was a one of the mutants, he has written a book from his experience and this is not both, both as well. Now we have to understand the course, course and the nature, because I divide, I divide my presentation into two parts. One is... Uh, sir, may I interject you? Uh, yeah. Could you just uh, raise your volume? I can't hear you. Am I audible now? Am Slightly, I audible? A little yeah. more. Okay, now. I uh, divide my presentation into two parts. That is, one is the nature of the mutiny, and second is the causes. What are the reasons behind that mutiny? Now, the question is that whether it was a revolt, a strike, mutiny, or an uprising. That there were so many so-called mutinies there in the armed forces in India during the Second World War. Between 1942 and 45, there were nine mutinies in the Royal Indian Navy. Most of them strikes or revolt against the British administration or the systems. But almost all these episodes were concluded by the British officials as mutants. Any representation for one cause, more than one person, it is always treated as a mutiny by the British. They made the rule and they executed in their own colonial countries. And most of the militaries around the world, even now we have been following the same rule. Therefore, many uprisings or any strikes in India were concluded as mutinies. For an example, the first war of independence of 1857, the British literatures address it as the Shipoy mutiny. The same is applicable here. Now the question is that when we analyze, was it is a mutiny or revolt or a strike? Yes, it began as a strike, hunger strike on 18th February, 1946. But later the cause the nature is changed because the my experience my interviews with the few participants and the material available there with the british archives it is started as a strike even the british writings or the documents accept the fact that it is started as a strike but they didn't have any political motives and when you call the mutiny mutiny in terms of real terms mutiny that means any any military person, a group of persons, they have, they were have, having an intention to throw the existing system, that means the government. They never had any plan to throw because they represented their issue, the service issues, discrimination or the food. In the general times, everyone has things about the, when, when we talk about the 1946 mutiny, it's begin because of the discrimination or the misconduct of the commander Commander Frederick King, the commanding officer of HMS Talua, and the food. These are the main issues. But something behind that we have to analyze. What was exactly the reason? Now, when we see the RIN episode, it started as a strike, then later it's a stand to be as a revolt, I would say. What is exactly the problem lies? That we have to analyze, we have to go back to the history and see it. Because the British policy in India, that's for expansion. And later, they want to continue in the colony. 
the unexpected war in 1939, the Second World War. This, before the war, the recruitment policy of the British, before and during the course of the war, when we analyze that, it is very evident that because of, there was a transition from the martial race theory to non martial Before the Second World War, the British in India, they followed a martial race theory in their recruitment policy, especially in the Indian Army. The Royal Indian Marine and the Royal Indian Navy continued with us. Before 1939, the entire recruitment that was focused on the Northwestern Frontier Province and the Reknagiri district of Maharashtra. It is interesting to note that till 1928, the 100% of all Royal Indian Navy ratings, they were Muslim. Men. They were recruited from Punjab, the Afghanistan, Belugistan, Rajasthan, now current uh, Technical District of Maharashtra. The recruitment policy, because the war requirement forced the Royal Indian Navy to recruit the people from all over India, comprising in physical, medical, and educational standards from non martial to the martial. When you see the number of people who were thrown out after the RIM episode, out of 523, very few sailors. They were recruited before 1931. And almost all sailors, the ratings, they took part in the RIM episode, were recruited during between 1939 and 42. That was one of the reasons. But they were exposure during the Second World War. They have come to know the other navies, their facilities, amenities, the better treatment, better service life, fair perks, elements. Here, what they felt, a lot of discrimination between clear-cut demarcation between the whites and the black. The difference in pay, perks, their mess, food, canteen facilities, and the officer's behavior towards the Indian recruits. This all, it was their the might. And when we analyze the recruitment policy from non martial to martial, apart from that, to get a massive mobilize, to mobilize the people for the Second World War, to meet the war requirement, they start recruiting and giving false promises during the course of war. And many officers, including Indian officers like Lieutenant Kohli, later he became the chief of the naval staff, he also, given his statement before the Royal Indian Navy inquiry commissioned that, there were a lot of false promises. It was brought out during the course of the war and in the morale reports by the naval headquarters to British Naval Admiralty, because most of the sailors' ratings, they are not happy because a lot of false promises were given during the recruitment time. This is also one of the main reasons behind the RAM episode, apart from the food and the misconduct of the Commander King. Now they are exposed to other countries on side too. Second part, when you analyze the standard of life, the standard of life when they compared themselves with the whites in the same onboard, the same ship, they are having much better facilities, better treatment by the officers. Even Indian officers' treatment towards Indian sailors, that was there, there was a lot of difference. Now, when you talk about the final conclusion, what happened exactly, what they wanted to have. The RAN episode. They formed a committee. It's a Royal Indian Navy appraising committee. They formed a committee. They expected that the political interference. They approached the CPI leader, I don't know, Asif Ali, and later. But the Congress did not support the mutiny as they expected. The demands, the, the committee put a demand because most of the demands, if you analyze that, it was all service related issues. They never expect even one point that they want a freedom. It clearly indicates that they didn't have any kind of political motive behind their strike. This all points put forward to meet the requirements that all service related, better treatment, better facilities, and release of the one sailor rating earlier he was arrested and put behind the bars. Because from the 19, December 1945 onwards, there was some writings and the British slogans were appeared on the walls of. HMS Talwar. Yes, some of them they got inspired by the ongoing 
Cute India movement uh, and the freedom movement. But my interview with seven ratings, they all accept the fact that they were not politically motivated. Because they joined because of some of them, few of them were forced to join the postmates or the botchmates. Everybody is taking part against. So they had a feeling against the year, against the whites, got an opportunity to express their issues. But later they were forced to, they were told to go back and surrender. But the surrender after a week, even though it's continued only for a week's time, it had a huge impact on getting the freedom. In March 1946, after this Maharian episode, Indian's report from India to British Admiralty, it clearly indicates that Indian armed forces cannot be trustworthy normal. Because for any colonial movement, any colonial regime in any part of the world, continue with their power there in the land. The backbone is always the military system. Because there are so many mutinies that are experienced during the Second World War in the army and the navy. When the same now Royal Indian Navy revolt it was happening, there was a mutiny, so-called mutiny in the Indian Army. And this matter was discussed there in the British Admiralty and the Parliament as well. And the ratings of uh, the 3rd June plan of 1946, it also talks about the RIN episode, its importance, because the Enquiry Commission report also forward their conclusion marks that. Indian forces cannot be trusted. Now we can, I would like to conclude that this entire episode from my analysis, it was the revolt, later officially be called as an RN, RN uprising, but it was a revolt in nature. And this problem lies apart from the food and the conduct of, misconduct of Commander King, the commanding officer of SMS Talwa. There were the main reasons it was laying before the Second World War policies, policy of annexation, continuation, and the consolidation and the rip, and the finally the recruitment policy change in the nature and so the recruitment policy and the final the demobilization. Because they become the old RN ratings, they are lost the hope in the system because they have all the false promises they came to know, and finally they didn't have any way ahead in their life. This is all my analysis about this. And the causes and the nature of the RM episode. Thank you so much, Mr. Skill. Thank you, Commander Mohan. That was a very interesting paper. Touched upon various aspects of the uprising, right from the uh, anthropological to the ethnographical aspects of it. Uh, so the next paper we have is uh, that of. Uh, John V. Loke Gaunkar, who is the research associate of the Maritime History Society. Her paper is on mobility of yeah, ideas that, that shaped the naval uprising of 1946, emphasizing the role of the press in the Rin mutiny that shaped public opinion. Ms. John V. Loke Gaunkar is a research associate at the Maritime History Society, Mumbai. Yeah. She, she holds two undergraduate degrees in English literature, history, and has completed Masters of Arts in History from the University of Mumbai. Her areas of interest are maritime history, military history, modern and contemporary Indian history. Her avid interest in the maritime studies leads to her association with the MHS. Welcome, Janvi. We can present your paper. From the introduction, Dilat. Good morning, everyone. It is my proud privilege to read a paper in this seminar that is curated to look at the naval uprising with a pure academic approach. To begin with, let me establish the theme of my paper. On the backdrop of intellectual awakening that emerged in the Indian society, which was already on the brink of independence, the media played a vital role in popularizing and propagating opinions amongst the masses which was a mix of Oriental and Western thoughts, beliefs, and ideology. The intellectuals and press were in the vanguard of the movement, particularly seen through the media reportage, with the content being both explicit and implicit, depending upon their stance. Can I have the next slide, please? 
Thank you. The naval uprising of 1946 was a very significant event, but its importance in the academic discipline was restrained as its nature was antithetical to the democratic aspirations of the nation. Although a discourse of this event is pertinent to understand various facets, particularly because the uprising gazed in the process of Indian independence. In this paper, I have made an attempt to assess the nature of the national and international media coverage during the Aryan uprising of 1946 that will look at the role of the fourth estate in shaping public opinion. Now, let me dive right into the topic because I'm sure the nation will want to know about this aspect of media and the role of naval uprising of uh, the media in the naval uprising of 1946. As the previous speakers have already covered a good deal of the historical background of Aryan uprising, I will keep it brief. In India, the political drive for freedom and evacuation by the British reached a crescendo in which the Indian National Army trial issue was violently exploited and Indians that continued to serve in the imperial forces were incited to emulate. According to the 1946 RN Inquiry Commission report, there were nine mutinies that took place in the Royal Indian Navy between 1942 to 1945. Most of these mutinies had uh, service grievances similar to that of the naval uprising of 1946. The investigations that had followed these mutinies disclosed that although the ratings were prone to indiscipline and had exaggerated notions about their own rights, which reacted unfavorably on their sense of duty and loyalty to service, there was also faults in the administration and that there was considerable room for improvement in the conditions of the service. As per the Aryan Inquiry Commission report of 1946, following up some of the causes of the uprising that are broadly classified as food, administration, effect of contact overseas, racial discrimination, routine, pay, effect of previous mutinies and incidents in the Royal Indian Navy, and recent mutinies in the Royal Air Force and the Royal Indian Air Force. So if we see, the causes behind previous mutinies and the naval uprising of 1946 had similar triggers more or less. These previous mutinies had an undoubted bearing upon the uprising of February 1946. They showed that there was a general discontent and dissatisfaction in the service and some of the grievances needed immediate redressal. They have contributed at least partially, though not very largely, to the discontent that prevailed in the service. Let us now look at the role of the press during the Indian independence movement. Media plays a, a, a vital role in shaping public opinion. The media reportage of what happened nearly 75 years ago is a valuable uh, archival data that we have today in order to study about the social, political, and economic conditions of the society back in the day. During Indian freedom movement, the main aim of the press was not to make profit, but rather to serve the society by sensitizing the public and encourage the cause of the Indian independence struggle. In fact, in this era, the press became nationalistic in the sense that they published strong opinionated articles condemning the British acts of violence, instigated people to support the national freedom movement, and sensitized the masses of what was happening in and around the country. Freedom of the press was of utmost importance as it is a powerful tool to propagate political ideas, but a lot of government censorship existed back then. Despite the imposition of stringent laws by the government in order to curb the independence of newspapers, the journalists would organize strategies to subvert these legal hurdles. They fought against the draconian laws in order to motivate people to participate in the freedom struggle. We will now look at the national media coverage of the Royal Indian Naval Uprising of 1946. Let us say that the media as we see today was in its nascent stage back in 1946. 
the news of the strike of Bombay was broadcast on uh, the All India Radio and was widely published in the print medium. Newspapers were widely available to sailors while they were in port and shore establishments. These papers communicated ideas that transpired in various events such as nationalist speeches across India. In the commission of inquiry conducted after the uprising, the officials are reported of their concerns regarding the sort of literature that the ratings had access to while they were on board. Copies of newspapers, nationalist speeches and ideas were all reported as to being found. What is also interesting is to look at and examine the tone and headlines of these news that differ between national newspapers that had diverse political alignments. In his book titled Revisiting Talwar, a study in the Royal Indian Navy, Navy Uprising of February 1946, Deepak Kumar Das writes, and I quote, the reactions of the nationalist press betrayed a panel perception. It is it too accused the naval strikers of indiscipline and lawlessness and the civilian sympathizers of Gundaism and vandalism. Now, if you look at the archival material, especially of the newspapers, we can find about the political alignments of the media houses as it existed back then. The Bombay Chronicle and the Hindustan Times appear to lower the nationalist spirit that permeated in the armed forces, but they resented its dissipation. To them, the incidents in uh, which the RIN ratings got involved were tragic and dangerous. Amrita Bazar Patrika expressed full agreement with Gandhi's condemnation of destruction, looting, and racial fury. The Hindu was more specific in its charge. It accused the communists of creating trouble to make political capital for themselves. As for their article, it was on their call of Hartal that the workers launched the protest which caused grievous loss of life and destruction of property. In an effort to refute this contention, the communist paper called People's Age sought to establish that workers' demonstration, or more broadly, the demonstrations in working class areas, did not lose their political character or lapse into hooliganism the responsibility of anti-social elements. Media reporters nationally did depict their political alignments and stance on the uprising, but when it came to the larger picture of the Indian independence movement, they criticized the imperialistic policies altogether. So far, looking at the background of previous mutiny and at the role of media along the national coverage of the uprising, it, may, it paints a clear picture of the social political environment of this period. Now, my question is is it not good enough to deduce that the RN uprising of the ratings became a politicized issue that led to the nationwide protest? Would it gain such a momentum as it had received had it not been for the media? We'll come back to this segment, but before that, let us take a look at the international media coverage of the RN uprising and a short segment on the photojournalism aspect. Media in the international domain has covered the uprising from a slightly different perspective. The, the reporting of the event of the uprising in Bombay and elsewhere in India was looked from the imperial angle. They were more concerned of the colonial lives and chattels. The international newspaper coverage never failed to report about the British officers that were fighting the mutineers and the condition of the imperial properties. Here is an example of an international newspaper, Sunderland Echo, uh, dated 19 February 1946, that has reported in the following words. The headline says, Indian Navy men in Bombay riots. And the opening lines of this article stated, Bombay was in turmoil for more than four hours when some thousands of native ratings of RIN went on strike at Talwar, beating up European civilians and British servicemen. Yet again, I'll quote Deepak Das uh, when he writes, except for a small insignificant section, the entire British press paid rich tributes to the leaders of both 
the Congress and the Muslim League for their restraint that they had shown throughout the disturbances. Rather, the cooperation their organizers, uh, organizations extended to the government in stamping out the uprising in Arayan and tackling the mob fury and restoring calm in Bombay. The Anglo Indian uh, papers cried more coarsely on the mutinous outbreak in Arayan and popular avoidance that followed. Times of India screamed in the headlines with the titles as Reign of Terror by, uh, by Ratings on Strike, an unprecedented orgy of arson and looting. The evening, view, uh, the evening news reported ratings run amok and unbridled uh, mob violence. Now, to look at the photographs as they were covered in press, it uh, gives a different uh, and an interesting aspect. In the mutual state of Janvi, you will have to wind up soon. Yeah. In the nascent stage of what can be called as modern journalism, photographs became an important weapon in, in broadcasting of on the on on ground reports. While the nationalist newspapers, the ones that wore lines with the Congress and the League, were reproachful of the uprising, they carried photographs of rebellious ratings, mobs in a tussle, riots on the streets, and of vandalizing shops. But liberal newspapers of uh, uh, for here, for example, we have the People Page that was uh, that carried photos of the ratings that were shot dead and killed in the riots. Moving on, uh, let me quickly look at the role of media in shaping public opinion during the naval uprising. The immediate causes of the mutiny in other ships and establishments were sympathy with Talwar, inflammatory articles in the press, and incitements by ratings from other establishments. This was taken from the Inquiry Commission report of 1946, and the immediate causes of the uprising are mentioned here succinctly. During the Indian independence movement, the media, most importantly the newspapers and the radio, played a vital role in arousing sentiments of people about the motherland and rousing people against tyranny. Mutinies in Arayan had occurred in the past, as discussed above, but it is important to analyze the reason behind the nature of uprising of 1946 and its impact. Unlike other mutinies, this particular uprising gained popular support and one of the primary reasons for this was media coverage that it received. What started off as a service grievance gained momentum as a struggle for the independence. The RIN uprising began as a mutiny against service grievances. The disputed causes of the mutiny ranged from belligerent anti colonialism stance through to less formally political grievances such as poor standard of food served to the sailors. The grievances that led to general discontentment in the naval rating were just the initial triggers. Uprising became politicized when it came to the fore through the medium of press in form of inflammatory articles. It no longer remained a service strike but gained a national character as India struggled for independence. To conclude, let me leave on a point where we analyze the role of media in this uprising as a tool for mobilization of ideas. Scholars have agreed to say that the naval uprising has hastened the departure of the British that led to the uh, that led to our independence. The role of the media must be appreciated with this angle. The mobilization of ideas helped a great deal. The Royal Indian Naval Uprising of 1946 fled due to the national media coverage. The mutinies that were suppressed between 1942 to 1945 in the Navy eventually led to the uprising. Had there been no news coverage, there are chances that the mutiny would never have gained such a momentum and had such an impact. The media coverage shaped public opinion, irrespective of the propaganda and stance and alignment of the press. It brought people together to fight against one common factor, that is the British Raj. In all likelihood, it can be said that the naval uprising garnered national support and spread like wildfire due to the press coverage it received. Had it not been carried in the newspapers, it may not have gathered such significant traction. And who knows, maybe this could have pushed us away from our independence by taking away the mere pressure from the, uh, from the British, which they were under, 
after they realized that they have lost the, that they have lost the support of the sword arm of the raj with which they have established our, their control over us thank you thanks tanvi it's a very interesting paper i have a series of questions to ask you right after this um the next paper we have is and the last paper for today is that of dr uh, sorry advocate mangesh vinayak tirodkar he'll be presenting on impact of the 1946 naval uprising on the british suprem supremacy in india advocate mangesh tirodkar is a practicing lawyer in the high courts of bombay and goa he also practices in the subordinate courts he is a legal consultant and a pan panelist on the thane district central cooperative bank he has completed his graduation he is currently also pursuing post graduate graduate diploma in security studies from the department of the department of civics and politics university of mumbai uh welcome advocate uh, tirodkar you may proceed to produce uh, present your paper thank you renard thank you thank you good morning to all respected dignitaries viewers ladies and gentlemen i would like to thank maritime history society for giving me this opportunity title of my paper is impact of 1946 naval uprising on the british supremacy in india i would like to begin the my presentation with the introduction of british on indian subcontinent as all of us are aware that vast water of indian ocean plays a significant role for the india's maritime strategy and india has been regarded as its center of gravity of the indian ocean region the different studies have made careful analysis that those who came overland from the other parts of the world mainly using the mountain passes in the northwest ruled some parts of the indian subcontinent for a while but those who came by sea route stayed for hundreds of years when british came to india with the intention to trade portuguese did not like the competition and the british has sensed this portuguese factor and to eliminate the same they sent a squadron of warships the said warship reached surat on september 5 1612 this date was regarded by the british as the foundation day of the royal indian navy as the first arrival of their warships in india and the formation of indian marine took place on this day after the war between the two portuguese admitted defeat and we drew their control over sea and land britishers became as masters of land and sea around area of surat to make effective trade they focused on marine channel and ship building in the later period indian navy was reorganized into two branches one at bombay and another one at kolkata known as bombay marine and bengal marine the main target of this navy was the protection of the indian waters they established a strong hold on eastern and western coast of india In the in the year 1934, Royal Indian Marine was renamed as Royal Indian Navy. Now I come to the main event, which changed the geopolitical situation of the British Empire. The event was the World War II. When World War II broke out, Britain started mobilizing all its resources from their colonies, including India. The navy was their main asset for the battlefield. Great Britain had started heavy recruitment for their naval support. training had been given to the indian sailor which was called ratings at that time on the one side britain was engaged in the war on the other hand the indian national movement was at its peak during the same period political obedience of indians had been reduced fight for independence from british raj was on the final step simultaneously netaji subhash chandra bose <clears throat> of the indian national army uh, was emerging as a charismatic figure among the youths and among soldiers who were part of the british army Britain was victorious in the World War II. However, it had weakened, damaged Britain from within. It caused heavy damages and losses of life and property. Now, I shall put some light on the event of mutiny. The mutiny in the Royal Indian Navy was not an overnight event. Many factors, circumstances were responsible triggering the mutiny. The revolt took place due to the accumulation of resentment over the long period among the sailors. During the recruitment of Indian sailors, British administration had promised a high standard of living along with monetary benefits. However, since the British Britain had completely weakened during the war, they could not maintain a large armies of foreign soil. The naval administration completely failed to live up to the promise they made. The condition of Indian sailor was not as good as European counterparts. Indian sailors were not permitted beyond certain rank. the higher positions were always occupied by the british officials 
the discrimination had reached such an extent that Indian officials, sailors, were not allowed to enter into Navy, Army, Air Force Institute concession canteen. Indian sailors' ratings were served bad quality food. Salary of the British sailors was 10 times more than the Indian sailors. The Indian barracks were fixed ties, and Indians were herded into train compartments. The Royal Indian, uh, Indian Navy revolt started on 18 February 1946, when 1100 sailors on the HMIS Talwa stopped work and declared an official strike at dawn. The Central Strike Committee was very clear about their agenda for the struggle of for independence and economic gains. One of their main demand was dropping the royal prefix and call themselves Indian National Navy. They further demanded release of all political prisoners and immediate improvement in their condition and provision of equal status with the British officers. In Bombay Harbor, the revolt quickly spread to 22 ships and the Kassal Barracks and Fort Barak shore bases. They captured Butcher Island, where Bombay Presidency's entire ammunition hold was stored, including telephone and wireless equipment. Wireless system came under their control, and they used it to spread the revolt to other sailor and ships. This incident shattered the command and discipline of the British administration over the Indian subcontinent region. The British government under Atlas Premiership was alarmed. Hence, this said mutiny was not the sudden outburst, but the result of various events, which was their fury against the oppression and discrimination they've, they've been facing for years. Now we have seen the causes of mutiny, but what was the impact? The said mutiny left a great impact upon the British authority. The strike spread like wildfire to military establishment in Karachi, Madras, Vishakapatnam, Kolkata, Delhi, Cochin, Jamnagar, and Andaman Islands to the shores of Middle East in Bahrain and Aden. In Karachi, Sellers struck on HMIS Hindustan of Monora Island. Local residents of Monora joined the procession in large number as well. British authorities were extremely alarmed by this development. British Army commander sent two troops. One is Baluch troop and another one is a Gurkha troop. Baluch troop refused to fire upon their Indian brothers. And Gurkha troop was known for their loyalty towards the British Empire. But in this case, Gurkha troops also refused to fire upon the Karachi sellers. Now the British government understood that the supremacy of the Brit uh, understood the loyalty of the Indian troops couldn't be taken for granted anymore. Eventually the supremacy of the British Empire of the Indian Constitution reduced drastically. India was the perfect geopolitical place to handle or channelize all their trade through the Indian Ocean. Due to this mutiny, this important channel was no longer a strategic part of British supremacy. To conclude this, I would like to comment that the novel uprising of 1946 was a significant milestone in the Indian national movement. By the end of the Second World War, the Indian nationalist movement had become very strong and urge of getting independence grew to a great extent. However, the armed forces were still under the control of the British command. As mentioned earlier, Navy was the main asset of the British Empire. British had never anticipated or never thought that a revolt would take place from within the people in the force, particularly in the Navy. The Navy, Naval Mutiny of 1946 was an unexpected blow on the very core British supremacy in India. So this mutiny shook the roots of British Empire in the subcontinent. So uh, by this comment, I would like to conclude the things. Thank you very much. Mangesh, that was a very nice paper. Uh, I'd request Adarsh to bring all the panelists on the uh, screen. Uh, there are a few questions that I'd like to ask, and most of the papers have covered quite a vast array of topics, which I found were very interesting uh, uh, as a researcher and someone who's looking at communities and ethnographies and uh, subjects that are very closely related to uh, Western paradigm of epistemologies. Uh, Kalish, uh, uh, Commander Kalesh Mohanan had spoken on uh, the uh, uh, how there were certain martial races that were employed into the uh, into the navy in, in, uh, into the naval forces, especially for in the ratings. Uh, why did uh, the British um, 
choose these races, these people? Did they think they were loyal to them or were they just, you know, what they just engineered so to actually um, to carry on the duty that they were assigned? Uh, <clears throat> When you analyze the martial race, the origin, the origin, the mar the origin of the martial race theory in India and its the execution, it was first hit to happen during the Indian Army. There are two ways. One is officer cadre, and second is non-officer cadre. Earlier, the old British Indian officers were recruited, not uh, officers were recruited from the royal families for the Indian Army, all officers. Yeah. And uh, other martial race the Brit Brit British Indian Army followed. Yes, their royal, royal, yes, their loyalty towards the service and Kushtini loyalty for the Gurkhas and people from Northwest Air Frontier Province. That's a loyalty was one of the reasons. Second, that's a physique. These two mm -hmm. face any kind of extreme weather conditions. For the same, because we, uh, when you see the Indian recruitment policy, till 1940, Indian Army was responsible for recruiting people for the tri service for the Army, Navy, and Air Force. And they used to get the best, the cream level used to take that for the Indian Army. That is the reason in 1940, after the beginning of the Second World War, the Indian Royal Indian Navy started recruiting ourselves, the people. Now, even yes, the Royal Indian Marine and the Royal Indian Navy followed the same martial race theory. Because in their official writings, they mentioned that the people belongs to Northwestern Frontier Province, like uh, the Belizistan, Afghanistan, you now the current Punjab, then Haryana, and only the people that's from the recognized district of Maharashtra. They are the only one community they had, at least they were very close to see. That's all they never seen, see in their life. Because the writings and their recorded history say shows that because they are actually looking for that's what the, the physic, physical standards. Basically, yeah. if you yeah. analyze that in the northwestern frontier province, they go through very difficult, extreme weather conditions. That is because during the summer time, the temperature goes up to uh, 45 or 48 degree and in the winter time because the temperature goes to zero or minus because they can be posted or deployed any any part of the world and clearly that talks about the people from the coastal areas like the eastern coast or the western coast the people from especially from south india they clearly mention about their physical standards because they they all belong to the very moderate weather condition areas because they won't be able to cope up the situation that was mm -hmm. one reason. The two things, mm -hmm. one is physical standards, second is loyalty. Okay. If, you, if you, when you will see the Gurkhas, because maybe their height ways or their uh, physical standards, they maybe they're shorter, but the yeah. loyalty, the same they expected during the Royal Indian Navy uprising, they asked them, uh, the Gurkha regiment to fire. It's the first time they refused. Because there are so many factors, we continue. Yes, but in 1939, the unexpected one, it happened because uh, mm -hmm. in 1939, early 30, late 38 or the early 39, the chart field yeah. he was submitted the uh, report that for the full flood uh, development of a full fledged navy in India, the three yeah. phase navy that recommended in 39. The unexpected war forced the Royal Indian Navy to recruit people from all over it. Then, yeah. So then you know the change from martial race to non martial. Yeah. So that was one of the reasons behind that because. Uh, the, uh, RAN episode because out of this 523 ratings, they were thrown out after the RAN inquiry commission. Almost around nearly 450 plus people they got recorded after the beginning of the second wave. Okay. So that means that the, all the martial race people that belongs to the northwestern Friendly province, they still mm -hmm. they, they were loyal to the service. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's a very good uh, summing up. Uh, next, I would come to Vishal. Uh, it was very, very, very peculiar subject that he had picked up was uh, the geopolitical impact of the naval uprising. Uh, I also look at geopolitics very closely when I do my research work, and there's something that resonated with me that when the British were in India, especially, they actually. Um, the port, the port cities were at the, um, you know, at the fulcrum of their economy, or they rather preferred the port cities. And as a matter of fact, two major port cities, that is Bombay and Karachi, were in the grips of the uprising. So, what was the economic impact 
on uh, the colonial establishment when this uprising happened why was this why were the britishers so shaken that they had to withdraw all of a sudden in 1947 although uh, independence was on the tables but i think this was one thing that hastened the entire process as atli says you could just elaborate on it vishal uh sure sir yes sir so basically the british raj which was uh, in 1946 along with the royal uh, air force uh, which the main went on the strike in support of the various problems in bombay naval dockyard and then uh, there were as we know the hunger strikes were started in uh, basically uh, at H M I S Talwar the water establishment at bombay naval dockyard then it started from uh, it influenced up to karachi in hms uh, basically the hindustan then even uh, the strike uh, it started on 22nd february 1946 uh, basically public transport it had become immobile then there were many kind of casualties uh, such as 228 civilians they died then similarly there was we, we can we could trace that similar events had started in uh, madras on 23rd february 1946 so you could see the port cities on western coast on uh, the karachi from bombay to karachi from karachi to madras in the again coromandel coast and then karachi to uh, calcutta it started but basically as we know the strikes of the naval mutiny they had a sobering effect on the calcutta port city compared to the karachi and the madras because uh, the strikes uh, basically as we could see uh, they had inherited the traditions from the american air force american royal air force and so the calcutta rights had a sobering effect for the short time and because of that the british cabinet mission it was from immediate to the naval mutiny uh, outbreak of the uh, bombay mutiny and then uh, uh, after the post uh, naval mutiny we could see in 1949 there was again the beginning of the non violent protest which was erupted along the various sites such as in canadian aircraft carrier magnificent in the, uh, the caribbean and in china also so uh, on the in the pacific ocean in the west and in the e east in the both the oceans uh, we, uh, if we see the parity of the overall world so there was a magnificent uh, aircraft water carrier in the caribbean sea and in china similar naval mutiny was happened uh, on the cruiser which named as chongqing basically uh, in the in the 1940 uh, the period followed by 1946 and again uh, as we note the general tucker he has noted that the as uh, the in late 1946 the ripples of the rin mutiny royal indian naval mutiny it was still disturbing the surface of the india so it had a long lasting impact not only on the port cities of the uh, calcutta madras cochin or in the inland uh, or karachi but also in the canada also in the caribbean sea and in the uh, uh, in the china sea yeah. so similar had uh, impacted and uh, because of that and also if we see uh, the Bur uh, the northeast part of the india it it had become the burmo burma indo china complex which was very uh, strategically significant which acted as a buffer to vigil over the indian ocean and the indian politics so this was very prominent um, so it had not only impacted the uh, calcutta uh, madras and uh, karachi and bombay ports in but also it had impacted the uh, overseas also in the pacific yeah. and in the atlantic and in caribbean sea so this was a far reaching geopolitical uh, impact of naval uprising according to me yeah which uh, actually brings me to uh, mangesh's uh, point where he raised that you know the ripples were felt as far as the uh, middle east uh, my question was why middle east because uh, we definitely know how this all these all these things actually transpired before the oil boom what what exactly who were these people relating to why these people in the middle east were finding cause with the indian ratings could you just elaborate on that uh okay. see middle east see the as, as i as i mentioned that indian ocean which connects the african 
peninsula sorry african coast as well as arab peninsula too so the the indian ocean always connect the india was the connecting part and britishers could connect the arab peninsula to the india for the trading purpose so that was mm-hmm. the main important place to connect the arab peninsula as well as india for that main trading purpose for the oil and other things uh, too so uh, that was the i, I tried to think oh, so that was the only reason why that the ripples of the uprising uh-huh, that of the main, main connection that is the main connection okay. yes that was the main so, connection because that india is a main uh, main point for in the indian ocean the standing center point of the indian ocean so were the indian troops recruited over there in uh, in the middle east because i'm sure that it was uh, a uh, the, much of the middle east was some form of a protectorate of the british empire yeah uh, must have uh, recruited the crew over there but uh, i don't have the right uh, information right now once i get the information i will uh, get back to you sure definitely that's a very good uh thing finally to my colleague janvi and uh, I'm very impressed by her paper though at the same uh janvi uh, uh your paper actually brought out the essence of various coverages that happened media coverages that took place during the uh, uh the pre independence era or the uh, the period of independence uh why were these ideologies uh so divergent in that sense because the common cause was that all of them were seeking independence uh from the british but they were covering very different aspects you had pointed out that the nationalist fervor was uh you know the machismo the communist was more playing into the uh the oppression and uh, the colonialists were actually uh, you know show uh, representing a side which they believed was uh, you know the anarchy what exactly uh, were the uh, various factions by even if they, even though they were actually looking at the same aim uh, representing very different images of the uh, events in the 1946 uprising could you just uh, shed some light on it so uh, as, as you have rightly put that uh, you know yes uh, political alignments and you know the diverse political alignments definitely existed but uh, it is also important for us to understand what the politics was all about you know with all the partition and uh, uh, the independence uh, thing going on in india Uh, because we are we are talking about 1946, which is uh, really very close to uh, what happened in 1947. So uh, the entire uh, independence uh, struggle was later, like you know, we if we see that there is a clear um, political faction and uh, it it exists, uh, it it has been existing uh, since a very long time. And but but I would say that it is important act if we look. Uh, at the history of uh, you know of partition history or the pre-independence era, it is important for us to look at it with a very objective point of view. We cannot have biases and uh, uh, you know political alignments and then look at history. So it is definitely important to have an objective uh, approach while we study today. So. That's a very good reply. There's one question by Kumaresh Sharma. If I may just highlight it, could someone highlight the event that led to the triggering of hunger strike on MHS Talwar? Would anyone like to take this? Yeah. So your your voice isn't heard. You're on mute. Uh, your voice isn't heard. You're on mute. Like the immediate cause, I thought that was the third issue and the misconduct of Commander Frederick King, the commanding officer of uh, HMS Talwar. These two incidents coincided at the same time because just before that incident in February, there was some anti-slogan writings in the paper during the HMS Talwar in December 
and later because then uh, the commanding officer's car was a deflated and again there was some uh, issues uh, happened because anti british flot and it's rise and seen there in the surroundings of hms talwar and the british were actually the naval indians also they were actually looking for the presence behind you know, the, i already said that because of the uh, 1942 tutija movement and the ina trials this all led to inspire the people a few of them were inspired by this nationalism movements but the immediate cause that happened the food issue it happened the first week of first week of february in hms talwar and the commander kings uh, misbehavior his foul language he used against the indians and they they complained the ratings complained and they approached the executive officer of the unit and officially they put up this complaint that for the conservation of the commanding officer which was turned down by the commanding officer himself then the food issue food become it was it, all of a sudden the food it become a issue there they started the hunger strike the later this all the demands were subsequently ordered into their groups and this is put forward through their royal indian navy operating committee it was 18 february so 1946 that is the day this began yeah. food yeah. yeah uh thank you everyone uh, with this we uh, wrap up the session the special thematic session uh we may now trans uh, yeah we may uh, actually move on to the session special session 1 uh please click on the same link uh for the next session